Hey everyone, uh, so today we're going to talk about connections temporal classification. Uh, this is something that we went over in lecture 13, but today we're going to take a more practical look at it. Um, we're going to go through some code and specifically uh, this is a visual demo and um, I hope that you can take some of the lessons from this and apply it uh, to your homework, uh, which is a speech application of CTC. But first, let's do a review. So when are we going to use CTC? Specifically, we are going to consider a set of many-to-many -many sequence prediction problems. Uh, in these problems, we have a series of inputs, and for each input, we are going to produce an output, and each one of these outputs uh, is going to be based on all of the previous inputs um, before that output. Um, and in these problems, generally, the labeling order matters, but there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one correspondence between outputs and labels. Uh, so an example of this is speech, and in speech we can have variable length um, uh, uh, sp speech recordings, and even if we constrain the problem to equal length speech recordings, there is variability in the sounds, uh, in the specific phonemes. So even if we have two of the same high-level labels, such as someone saying the word dog, uh, and we output a prediction on each frame, it's not necessarily straightforward how we can provide labels for each frame uh, if we just know that uh, a specific word or set of phonemes is, is present in a given speech recording. Um, but even, and so for the third reason, uh, even if we have uh, a label for each output, um, we may need to impose a structural constraint on the, the output sequence. Um, so going back to homework one, you, you can uh, remember that we had these uh, sub-phoneme sequences, and there was a restriction on them that there were uh, for each phoneme there are three sub-phoneme states. Uh, you can transition from uh, as zero, uh, the the first uh, sub-phoneme state to the second, the second phoneme state to the third, um, and then from the third to any of the other starting uh, sub-phoneme states. Um, and we can actually use CTC to apply this um, constraint to training our um, for current neural, neural networks. Okay, so now let's get some intuition uh, for the CTC loss. Um, and I'm gonna talk about this in the method, uh, the, the constraints that are placed on the output uh, that the paper authors use, but this is not necessary exactly. I'll, I'll talk more about this later, but just remember that this is uh, the most common setup um, and exists in most of the accelerated frameworks for CTC but know that other constraints can be placed uh, for other problems. Um, so specifically, we're gonna have a set of labels. Uh, think about this, uh, this could just be the alphabet, um, and then a labeling is going to be a, a sequence of these labels. Um, and so right now we're gonna add a blank symbol to our set of possible labels. And then we're gonna design the network such that at each uh, output, um, we uh, output a classification uh, of one of these labels. So we're gonna have a sequence of labels, um, and then we're gonna collapse this sequence um, with the rule being that repeated uh, labels all collapse to that singular label, and this includes the blank. Um, and you can see here in the last example that the blank is used such that we can have ground truth labelings with repeated labels. Um, that's the use case for, for the blank here. Um, and at the end of the day, we can compare our collapsed output with the ground truth label. Um, and I'm gonna call these output sequences uh, paths. And uh, it's important to note that um, for every labeling, there are many paths um, that can collapse to that labeling. But uh, for a given path, there is uh, only one uh, labeling. Okay, so let's look at a practical problem right now. So uh, consider handwriting recognition. Um, so here we have a, a bunch of images. Uh, they are of equal width, uh, equal height, um, but they contain uh, variable uh, numbers of characters. Um, characters can be at different positions. Um, so the idea is that we extract some feature representation um, from this. Um, that preserves um, the spatial, uh, the relative spatial information of the different characters, 
And then we pass from left to right uh, those features into an RNN and we will output a probability distribution um, over, over, over characters. And uh, say we take the, the character with max probability at each step and with random initialization, we get uh, this output, which collapses to, keep, uh, to this long thing, which is obviously pretty far from the ground truth. And the goal is after training, uh, we may produce uh, some path that collapses to the ground truth. Okay, so what we saw is that the network outputs a probability distribution over all the possible labels and the blank symbol. The idea is that um, if we sample from all these distributions independently, we want to maximize the probability that we will get an output sequence that collapses into the ground truth. Um, so the idea is that this loss is really just the negative logarithm of the probability that I just described. So we can describe what we've been talking about a little bit more formally. So let's let L be the set of labels and L prime be the set of labels that include the blank. So for a sequence T, we can now denote the set of possible paths as pi, um, where the size of pi is L prime to the T. So given a sequence of inputs x of i and a labeling z of i, um, where we uh, constrain the size of uh, the labeling to be less than the size of the input, and we assume that the size of the input is the same as the output sequence. So denote the probability of a given labeling as uh, p of z given the input um, and some parameters, and these parameters are going to be our recurrent neural network um, and we're going to do the maximum likelihood estimate of all of the, of the probabilities over all the labelings in our data set. Okay, so now we can talk about that collapsing function that we mentioned informally before. Uh, so let's define this many to one map B, uh, which maps from the set of all possible paths to, uh, to the set of labelings. Um, and so, so B is performing this, this collapsing operation, which we defined before, and you can see in this example here. But we're also going to define B inverse. Um, and B inverse is now a one-to-many map. Uh, so it goes from a labeling to all the possible paths that will collapse the labeling. And we can think of, uh, now we can denote the uh, likelihood of a given labeling as the sum of the probabilities of all these paths that collapse to Z. Um, and uh, we can notate that as uh, the paths come from B inverse of Z. So now we can put these all together um, and we can plug in uh, what we found for, for P of Z, uh, which is the sum uh, over the probabilities of all the paths given the input sequence um, in our parameters uh, to get our uh, maximum likelihood parameter estimate. Uh, we can take the log, which results in a sum, and then uh, finally, uh, so this can work with our gradient descent optimizer, uh, we just can take the negative of that uh, and now we're doing, doing minimization here. Let's try to compute the probability of a given labeling by summing over the probabilities of all the paths that, that could collapse that labeling. So a naive way to try to do this is to generate all the possible sequences with their probabilities, then we can collapse each, each sequence and then we just sum the probabilities of those that collapse to the correct value. Um, so let's put this in numeric terms. Uh, let m be the number of inputs, m the number of labels, and then c is the size of L prime. This yields a computational complexity on the order of c to the m times m. So obviously this is exponential in complexity um, and not very ideal. So there is a better way to do this, um, and we can actually derive a recursive formula uh, for these probabilities, and then exploit the existence of common subpaths. Uh, and this is generally the reason why, why we uh, call these paths. Um, and there are uh, dynamic programming algorithms uh, there to uh, do this in much less than exponential time. So in lecture 13, the professor goes through this in much more depth um, and talks about the uh, possibilities of other constraints that you can place on the sequences um, and then uh, solve uh, efficiently with these dynamic programming methods. Uh, luckily for us, we're going to be using tools that impl implement these optimizations and often do it uh, in a low-level language. Um, so we can pick up the speed and uh, these good time guarantees. So now the question comes to what do we do at test time? Um, so right now we have trained network. We're going to output a sequence of probabilities. Um, and 
we, we, we may just hope that by taking the uh, max probability at each step and then using those labels and then collapsing them uh, using the function b, uh, we may get a good, good result, and we might. But this is a generally a greedy approach, and it, it just does not guarantee that we will get the most likely sequence of labels. Um, so there is a uh, more intensive algorithm to determine the true answer of this, but we can also run an approximate search, uh, a beam search, which is a method where we, keep, where, you, where we can keep track of multiple best paths um, and we can just iterate over these to uh, reduce the greediness of our search, but not exactly come to an um, exact answer. And this is generally what we're, we're going to use uh, and suggest that you use in, in your assignment. So in fact, the formulation that we've just described is not the only formulation of CGC that exists. The setup in which we introduce a blank character um, and design this collapsing function uh, from the uh, set of possible outputs to the uh, set of labelings um, is actually just what's described by the original paper authors. Um, and the CTC uh, loss uh, doesn't limit us to that. Um, and there are actually other uh, ways that we can place constraints on our outputs that are useful that uh, don't follow this method, even though that the, that the methods that we, we've described are very common um, and implemented natively uh, in some of the frameworks that we're going to use. Um, so, for example, we can get rid of the blank. I mean, if we can guarantee that uh, the same label can't occur twice in succession, um, which is the case um, for some simple varieties, um, uh, then we can just create a version of CTC without blanks. Um, and there are times when it can be useful to have many different kinds of blanks, uh, perhaps one for e each possible non-blank symbol. And we can even follow certain finite state machines. So. Uh, consider in homework one, which, which we, we actually described before, where there are uh, three subphonemes per phoneme, um, and there is a uh, only there is only non-zero probability of, of transitioning uh, from the first to the second subphoneme, from the second to the third subphoneme, and then from the third to the beginning of any triplet. Um, and CTC can actually um, apply these constraints to the, out, uh, to the output sequence. Practical problem that we're going to apply CTC to is a handwritten digit recognition problem. We have a data set of images, contain, each one containing a sequence of digits. Uh, for now, to simplify things, it's going to be a fixed number of digits. We're going to pick 10 per sample. Uh, we're also going to constrain the size of each image to 172 pixels wide um, and 36 pixels tall. So the goal is that given an image, we're going to output the correct digit sequence. Um, and interestingly, these digits can overlap, and they are handwritten, uh, provided from the MNIST data set, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. You may note that there are some constraints placed on this problem that are not um, there in homework three. So for example, we know that there are 10 uh, digits per labeling. Um, and we also are not dealing with variable size uh, sequences. So Every uh, sequence here is 172, though uh, we may uh, build a feature representation uh, using a CNN uh, that will bring it down to some uh, width, uh, but that is fixed. So at the end of the day, there will be a fixed length fed into our RNN for this problem. But even with these constraints, this, this demo will still be very informative for how you, should, how you can get started implementing your CTC component of Homework 3. Now let's take a look at the code. So in order to solve this problem, I've prepared a Jupyter Notebook, uh, which imports uh, some code in a Python source file, uh, which I call cdcmodel.py. Uh, you can find this notebook, CTC Handwritten Digit Reader, uh, in the tutorials repository on GitHub. Uh, this is recitation eight, uh, so you can pull it up. There's a readme for how to download the uh, prerequisites. A quick reminder that this probably will not work on Mac or Windows, uh, you will need a Unix system uh, because we're going to need to install some third-party libraries, uh, one for the CTC loss and uh, the second for the uh, CTC beam uh, search decoding. Um, both those things need to be built and generally I've run into a lot of issues installing on uh, Mac and I would probably expect the same for Windows, although I definitely recommend you give it a try and uh, let us know how it goes. So right now, uh, in this Jupyter Notebook, 
we can generate the data set if it doesn't already exist. We can load the data. And you can see the uh, data that we're dealing with here. Uh, we have 20,000 samples. Um, these are 36 by 172 images. And each label is a uh, integer sequence of the ground truth. Let's do a brief overview of the model that we've built to solve this task. So we have a standard convolutional neural network, which will take in our one channel image. And this is going to output an embedding, which is batch size by number of feature maps, by the height of each feature map, by the width of each feature map. So what we want is, is we want our RNN at each step to take in a single column of the feature map from left to right. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to reshape our embedding such that we have batch size by feature maps times the height by the width. So now, now, now we've done is we've taken each column and we've strung them out. We've basically concatenated them. And now what we want to do is we want to permute the axes. That way uh, our input is amenable for the PyTorch LSTM implementation, which expects a tensor of number of time steps, the dimensions is the number of time steps, batch size, and then, then the feature size, which is going to be 32 times the height of our feature maps. Then we're going to feed that in through our LSTM, and we're going to get log logits for each time step which will be the um, width of our feature embedding. So let's go ahead and run this. And this will run for about 20 epics. Okay, so I'm gonna speed up training here uh, to make this a little bit more bearable in the video. But uh, as we watch this thing train, uh, notice that the value that uh, follows eval is the uh, it is an error metric that, I, that is called the Levenstein distance. And the Levenstein distance is basically a what you think of as an edit distance. So given two strings, uh, how many edits do you need to make on one string um, to uh, turn it into the other? So the first string is your prediction, and the uh, output string and the other string is your target. And the Levenstein distance um, quantifies that. All right, so now we've trained the model. Now, now we can use our bead search decoder to actually take uh, some samples and try to uh, figure out w what digits are, are handwritten. So here we're gonna, we're gonna sample 15 uh, images from our training set. And we're gonna run them through our decoder. So you can see that things are working. Even on uh, images that have some pretty tricky overlap, you can see these two zeros here, or this one and this nine. And this is frankly really strange. Even, even me, this, this would be hard to, to figure out that this is a four. So you can see that this is a very powerful method. Um, it's worked very quickly. And uh, hopefully uh, this explanation will help you figure out where to start for part three. Thank you.